Okay, so some, some key considerations that, that are going to enter into whether you want to grow your own or purchase them is going to be the culture system used. So are you an aquaponics person? Are you going to be a pond culturist? Are you going to be a, a, an indoor research system? The species grown. Okay. Uh, the number required. I think that makes sense as to what you want to do. Uh, fingerling price if you purchase them. Availability. What's the cost to produce your own, especially in relation to what the fingerling price is if you purchase them. And your level of expertise. Okay. How comfortable you, uh, you are. Okay, so in terms of species grown, we're going to go through each of these. Is Some species feed train very, very easy, easily. What I mean by that is, is you bring them in as fry, you get them on feed, and, and a large percentage stay on feed, and you can use them in your system. Uh, others take more effort and expertise. Uh, you might argue tilapia, koi, and bluegill are very easy, almost like falling off a log. Um, in fact, I can tell you, I can go to anybody's bluegill pond and have them eat and feed within probably within a week. That's just they just they figure that game out real quick. Uh, yellow perch requires some finesse, and that's what I do, by the way. Is I'm a yellow perch producer, and largemouth bass can be difficult. There are guys getting real good at this, but there are far and few between. Culture systems. Pond culture. This is what I do. Okay, I'm a pond culturist. Uh, most pond culturists, if they're any size, produce their own fingerlings. Okay. Uh, most newly hatched fry, especially things like perch, bass, bluegills, are native fish. Uh, need time in a fertilized pond prior to feed training. In other words, you just don't take a recently hatched fry and start throwing feed at it. Okay, there are species you can do that with, like rainbow trout, you can do that, do that with, but not the, the fry of, of, of most of what we grow in Ohio. There are people working on this here, Columbus and other places, but they haven't gotten to the point yet where I think anybody's willing to try that. Uh, so we rely on fertilized ponds to grow our, our finger leaks for about the first five weeks, six weeks. Yeah, what I mean by fertilize is you're putting in nitrogen, phosphorus, and you're growing a, a plankton bloom. They feed on that. When they get up to a certain size, you bring them in, you feed train. Recirculating aquaculture systems, most of those facilities typically buy their own feed train fingerlings. In other words, they're not producing them, they're, they're, they're buying them. Okay, and this gets back to indoors, it's hard to get a lot of these species to take feed when they just hatch. So they're relying on somebody like me to help them get started. Again, trout would be the exception. Trout go on feed really, really quick. Next, aquaponics. I don't know of anybody in Ohio or the Midwest that are producing their own feed trained fingerlings. They're all buying them. Whether it be tilapia from New Mexico, perch from me, largemouth bass from uh, either Illinois or Missouri or Arkansas. And part of that reason is due to small system sizes. That's one of them. Okay. Our aquaponics operations, while we have quite a few, are not huge. They're fairly small yet. Um, and so they, uh, they can't justify doing that. And you also got to remember in aquaponics, you are worried about something else too. What's that? Plants. Plants. It's just not about fish. You get the plants to, to, to do well too. So uh, it can get a bit overwhelming if you try and do too much too quick. Yeah. Bill, I think this is working now. Oh, you think it's working? Okay, the number required. Okay, so you've got this system, whatever you're gonna grow them in, and you should have, based on your business plan that you're developing, some idea of how many fingerlings you're gonna need. Okay. And at the extremes, the decision is fairly easy. What I mean by that is if you need less than a thousand feet trained fingerlings, you're gonna purchase. You don't want to put all the infrastructure in to feed train and do all that. You're gonna purchase. That's not going to be a huge cost. And you might even argue 10000 you're going to purchase. But if you get up higher 10000 uh, now you might want to run the numbers. Put the pencil to the paper and see if it's worth your effort, cost-wise, to grow your own. Maybe not right away. 
question for you. So if you're going to buy your own, what is the market? I know market can fluctuate, obviously. You mean if you're going to buy them? Yeah, correct. It's very species dependent. Feed train perch are going to run about 15 cents a piece. 15 cents. Uh, bass, about the same. Bluegill, 10. Tilapia. I haven't priced tilapia in a while. Anybody priced tilapia figure on your Priced them in a while. So as you get bigger, it starts to make sense. Now, there are some fairly decent sized aquaponics operations up in Milwaukee that um, need hundreds of thousands of tilapia and they don't produce their own. They're still buying them. They can't justify all the infrastructure and the tanks and, and what have you. <laughs> so you would have to make that judgment call based on your business plan. And so when you get in between, all these other factors come into play as to whether you're going to produce your own or whether you're going to, uh, to buy. Any questions so far? And so, availability is going to enter. Okay, availability. <laughs> Are they there when you need them? Nope. Okay. Um, if not, you may need to produce your own. Uh, perch, for example, and I'm going to use my as an example. I, I supply perch fingerlings for a number of aquaponics operations, but they're not buying the small stuff you just saw. Okay, they're buying four to five inches at the end of the first year. So that basically, because you want to move perch when the water's cool, um, we can give them fingerlings, get them their fingerlings in October, November, and again in the spring. It's very tough to, to load up an aquaponic system with perch in the dead of summer. They don't handle very well in that high heat. But you could produce those fingerlings if requested. Um, well, I could. It's going to okay. cost more. Right. Okay. What do the four or five inch ones cost? Uh, about sixty cents a piece. And one of the things you have to one of the things you have to to go through your business plan with is, is <clears throat> let's say you start an aquaponics operation and perch can command a pretty good price for you. Okay? I mean, you can, you, can, you can make money on the fish. You always hear a lot of times about aquaponics, you, you hope just to break even on the fish. You can make with perch, you can make money in aquaponics. Um, but if you start with inch and a half feed train like you just saw down there, Okay, now you're looking at uh, 10 to 11 months to get them up to eight, nine inches. If you want to sell them to a pond and lake management company, if that's what you're going to do. If you buy four to five inches, you can run two crops through that same system in one year. Hmm. So you got to run the numbers. You're talking six months. Uh, Shorter than that, if you think. Now again, in RAS, in RAS, I can grow them faster up to nine inches than I can in aquaponics because in aquaponics, you're only feeding what your plants need. And you may not be feeding what you would in a RAS system of comparable size. Okay, so I've seen some, I've seen some, uh, some RAS systems that uh, might take eight or nine months just because they can't, they don't have enough plants to feed that, that fast, okay? And I, this is not a water quality, but what, anybody care about, how can I tell whether we're not growing enough fish in, a rat, in an aquaponic system or we're growing, trying to grow too many? What can I monitor and where? Too, too many is uh, piping, right? No, that's water quality. Before, uh, that's water quality. Yes, exactly. Test ammonia just right. before it comes back to the fish tank. Okay? And if you have ammonia levels that are too high after the grow beds, you don't have enough plants. You're pushing too much feed through those tanks. Eventually, your fish will tell you that, and they may tell you that by floating, <laughs> which you don't want. If you've got no ammonia, then you could grow more fish potentially, but be careful. Don't double it overnight. But the ammonia will tell you. A question on that. Uh, I'm having some problem with now. You know, I just got a different kind of feed that I put into my system. And um, I have no ammonia coming going just before I go back into my you're going into my sump after the bed. 
that. But uh, I'm just trying to figure out what my problem is. Is it is it the high protein? I mean, or the lack of protein? What's the problem? The lack of protein in the uh, in the feed. Well, what's the problem first? I mean, are your plants not doing well? Well, the plants are no, they're, they're not. They, they don't seem to be growing. They just seem to be holding, holding, holding steady. steady. Yeah. What are you, what feed are you using? I, I I know what I was using before was a a thirty one percent protein. For tilapia. Yeah. For tilapia. Yeah. That should be pretty good. But now I have you know and, and I was having a high protein. I mean I was having a high ammonia, reading high ammonia, and that's how I was able to mm -hmm. stabilize my system. Now this new feed, I don't know what it's what's in it. And, uh, if you got no ammonia coming back to the system, you probably you may not be putting enough feed into those tanks to get the plants. They may be nutrient starved. Test nitrates too. Right. Well, that's another, that's another thing. My nitrite level is zero, but my nitrate level is low, very low. Oh, well, you can probably feed more. Are the fish eating? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're eating. Yeah. You you might be able to. You may not be feeding enough to to support your plants. Well, you can't force feed because you may not have enough fish in the tank to be able to right. feed that amount. I have they're about 35, and they're good size. They're eight inches. Tilapia, koi are generally available year-round. Those are if you want to do those. I will, you know, I'm not a big fan of tilapia and, and aquaponic systems. Two reasons. I know they they easy and they do well. You're growing them, but but two reasons. One is that price market's dropped. If you want to sell them as food fish. The imports are killing it. Um, and then the other thing is, if you are running a fairly large operation, how many of you have been to Jenny and Doug Blackburn's up All there? Of All of you. Aha! Uh -huh. I've had a rough four months with health stuff, so I don't know everything's going on. But anyway, um, we had a couple of winters. And, well, what was it, three or four years ago? They were so brutal something like that where gas, natural gas was rationed and everything. And everybody that was growing tilapia tanks in greenhouses and stuff lost all the tilapia, got too cold, just flat out died. They lost them. Um, part of that was the winter. The other part was is when they, when they planned their system, they didn't think about, can I keep my tilapia warm in a cold winter? They just kind of thought, eh, typical winter out here, no big deal. Well, we had two back-to-backers that were bad temperature wise and people lost their tilapia. And so that's one of the reasons and uh, I'm not a big fan of tilapia unless you're like in a building where you have some control. And you can put heaters in, okay? You can put big heaters in. If you want to see a if you want to see electric dial spin, <laughs> put those in. Um, bluegill, largemouth bass, they'll first tend to be available seasonally. Often spring only, although I would argue we can get them we can get perched to you in the fall, and you can even get bass and, and bluegill in the fall too. Fingerling koi, fingerling cuts if purchased. What is the actual cost, okay? You want to buy from a wholesaler. Okay, that's what I do. I don't do any retail. <coughs> now most of my sales are not to aquaponics. Most of my sales are going into pond and lake management stocking. Um, and I am not going to sit here and take 200 fish here, 30 fish there. That's not my cup of tea. My guys, these companies are coming and buying them in lots of five to ten thousand, and that's that's why I'm wholesale. So my price is far below the retail. You cannot afford to be going and paying retail for yellow perch or bass or bluegill or whatever. You can't do that. Okay, you've got to find a wholesaler. <coughs> Because remember, if if you're buying the retail, you're you're paying their markup. Okay, and even with me, you know, I mean, I got to make money, so you're paying my, you know, I'm making money off of it. But you got to remember what a retailer does. He's buying from me, and then he's got to hold them. Oftentimes for weeks and weeks and weeks, he's got to truck them all over the state of Ohio. There's no rhyme or reason how these guys work. I have seen perch literally pass each other on the interstate. 
go from one end of the state to the other because you know, oh, I'm gonna, somebody called this guy in the west, I'll ship it to you over in Coshocton, and then there's somebody over by New Philadelphia that's shipping them to Xenia. What the heck is all that about? Cost differs by size, so what size do you really need? Uh, I'll sit here and tell you that if you're starting, how many of you think about aquaponics? Okay. If you're doing yellow perch, those four to five inch perch are a lot more forgiving than them little buggers for a while. Um, they tend to handle better, uh, they go on feet, they, you know, they eat right away. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you start with these little guys, it's going to take a while before the feeding rates get up to the point where you get enough nutrients going through that system. It's going to take a while. And if you've, if, if you've had any aquaponics talks, you can't overwhelm those systems initially with feed. It's a very slow coming online system. And if you aren't feeding much, it'll take even longer for the plants to, to grow. So I think most of these folks are realizing, I don't want to start with the little guys. I'm going to start with four to five inches. Some of them start with six to seven, actually. Um, and they just, they just move things through quicker. You could buy feed trained or non-feed trained. Uh, could feed train them yourself. You know, that's, you know, I can sell you 5,000 right out of the pond that aren't feed trained yet, but you're gonna have to have all the apparatus in place to feed train them. And that's money and time. I think most of you folks would rather at this point Get them in there, throw feed, they eat, and you're off to the races. Cost to produce your own, okay? There's a lot of infrastructure, and I don't know if I have time, but I got another talk. I can show you what we do. You can see it all on a commercial scale. Um, but there is infrastructure. Ponds, tanks, pumps, same, varies by species. It's, it's, it's not overly easy. People say I make it look easy, but you gotta remember, I have a fisheries degree, 30 years experience at OSU, been doing this for years, and I still have challenges. This was one of the most challenging feed training years we ever had. Part of that was a cold April, followed by a hot May. Drove us nuts. Since we're gonna be at your facility next week, you could probably enlighten us. Not next week, in July. In July. Don't scare me. <laughs> <laughs> July. I'm talking about next month, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, I, we can enlighten you, but it'll probably right. be after the workshop if you want right. to stay. Right, right, right. Yeah, because I'll stay until dark if you want me to. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, there's all these kinds of producing fry. Um, so you need to gather the cost data, develop an enterprise budget for producing your own feed training feed noise and comparing it against against uh, what it would cost to purchase them wholesale. Okay. This is a big one. Level of expertise. Okay. Do you have the necessary knowledge necessary to produce and handle fry? Okay. They're delicate. They're very, very delicate. You have to be very careful with what you're doing. Um, are there resources, contacts available to navigate that, that world, delicate world? Or are you just going to reinvent the wheel? I'm getting tired of people reinventing the wheel. It drives me nuts. And I realize there are people out there that don't work with you. Just don't deal with them. But there are people like me that will work with you if you want to do this. I've got some people this year tried. I mentioned I have a I retired from OSU. I have degrees, fish biologist, ecologist background, worked in aquaculture at OSU for a long time. Uh, I have a, a, a set of knowledge that most of you aren't going to have, just because that's what I did in school. There's some of you that have something to offer that I wouldn't have a clue as to what to do. And you know, one of, your, one of the headaches you have is, is these operations. You're, you're one headache away from potentially going out of business. So, you know, you probably want to err on the conservative side and start conservatively and, and work your way in from there. Maybe gently transition to your own fingerling production. And what I mean is, let's talk, let's, let's use Jenny and Doug as an example. 
they're talking about greenhouses four and five here before long. I don't know if they mentioned that last month or not. They're talking about it. Uh, four and five. Now they probably won't do it for a while, but there's an example where at some point they may want to put a half acre pond out back for perch fry and grow their own family. Okay, that would be an example that at some point they might want to do that. But they have all these years where they've got the plants going, they know how to deal with that. They certainly know how to work with fish now from four to five inches on up and water quality. So at some point they may say, well, let's back up and try the fingerling route. Okay, and what they're going to want to do is, is start out even slow there, and make sure that, that we're their backup. So they don't, if they take a bust, they, they aren't left out in the cold. Some final thoughts. Um, you can, you know, it, it can be cost effective, uh, but it can vary among operations. Many factors influence the, the, the decision to produce your own feed train fingerlings. If I were in most of your shoes, I probably would purchase for a while. I'm not trying to drum up business, but just think it's safer. Uh, general aquaponics, small beginning, traditional operations are better served purchasing your own feed train fingerlings. Almost everybody in Ohio that's new fits into this category. Nobody comes out and builds 30 ponds at one time. I only have five, six now. Six ponds. Larger operations should, consider, should can seriously consider producing their own fingerlings at some point. Which I think Jenny and Doug obviously might be getting to the point where they might think about it. They may never think about it. Any questions real quick? Okay, just to give you a flavor of what we go through to feed train. We're feed training hundreds of thousands a year. And I'm not big by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so we got relatively small operation, large of Ohio standards, four one acre ponds, two half acres, all drainable. It's a necessity if you're growing fingerlings. Okay? Uh, eight foot maximum depth, and it has to be drainable. And the reason is, is during the winter, you want a pond to dry out, crack, degrade some of the phosphorus and nitrogen. You want any potential aquatic insects that could eat fry in the spring, killed, knock back the algae and any plants that are there. So you have to have them drained. Do you drain yours every year? The fry, for the fry. For the fry. Yep, for the fry. And water source for us is a well. We do not pull, nor would I ever pull from a drainage ditch. Anybody know why? Exactly. Not only in crap, but nutrients that I can't control. Okay. It's amazing what stupid little fish are in our drainage dishes. Okay. Our building's not big. It's a 30 by 40 foot pole barn concrete floor. Best thing we ever did to put concrete floor in. Best thing we ever did. First year we didn't. Bad news. Put a concrete floor in. We got uh, 4,000 gallon tanks, 600 gallon tanks. Uh, you can see these are the thousands. Here is the, uh, some of the uh, 600 gallons. We got a door here, we can back in. If I were redoing this, there'd be a door at the other end. I could just drive through. Hey, you always want to do things different after you do it. I'd have another door. That'd be a little longer building. And why do you need concrete floor? <laughs> it's easier to build tanks on, for one, and get them level. Okay, concrete, gravel, when you're all day on it, is harder than walking on concrete. It's terrible. Uh, the concrete floor lets you get, get it up so that, yeah, things drain better. And if you have water that, yeah, clean it, but you have water that comes in and you know, our, when we get a real heavy rain, we'll put water at the bottom of that building. But the floor gets us up above, anyway. Any problems? Um, real hard to clean and disinfect too. Hmm? Gravel is real hard. Yeah, that's damn near impossible. Um, the large tanks can receive both well and pond water. Smaller tanks are pond water only. Um, we rarely, rarely ever use the well water in the tanks. Very, very rarely. Um, and all tanks are equipped with blower and air stones. Here's our pond layout. When, in a good year, uh, this year you'll see three empty ponds because 
I planned on keeping fingerlings back for second year grow out, but the people overwhelmed me for fingerlings, their first year fingerlings this year, four to five and five to seven inch fingerlings. I ended up selling them all. So here I got ponds I can't put in the second year, so they're gonna sit dry most of, most of the summer. Uh, but in a good year, typically what happens is we'll have a pond over here with second year grow out and some fry production ponds here, three. And then this is a pond where I hold the fingerlings during the winter, okay? And then I got a broodstock pond. We, are, we have our own broodstock. We do everything. We don't make our own feed, but fish-wise we do everything. Okay, pond fry production. Again, we had talked about sitting dry. We typically fill the ponds two to three weeks prior to hatching. We mix pond water and well water when we do that. Okay, what, what, what's the problem if you just start with all well water? No nutrients. No nutrients and no food chain, and you'll wait forever to get that going. So we go half and half. Um, ponds are fertilized weekly with phosphoric acid and nitrogen to increase plankton. Again, this is this is uh, second, third week of March when this is all starting to happen. Okay, this would be different if you're doing bass and bluegills. Different timing. Uh, fry are stocked in the ponds at a rate of 175,000 to 200,000 per acre. We do not count them. Okay, we actually do not weigh them. Anything like that. Uh, basically, you could, but some research was down here done by Jeff Wallet. I find I can use that name. That showed in a typical good egg strand per inch how many eggs per inch. And so you, we can look at our egg ribbons and know about how many eggs are in there and have a, then you can put uh, X number of ribbons in a tank for cold, for incubation and, and go from there. Fry remain in the ponds for five to six weeks. And this last bullet is what blows everybody's mind away. It's done perch historically. We go small. You will read in the literature from Wisconsin and other states that Go get your fry at an inch and a half to feed tray, an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half to feed tray. Yeah, we did it that way for years. And our return was terrible. We got 10% back of that 200,000. We were doing well. Okay, and then we started noticing, and my retirement had a lot to do with this, but then I had more attention to detail. We noticed that between three quarters of an inch and an inch and a quarter, we lost 90% of the fry. The pond simply could not support it anymore. We were running out of food. So we go in early. We've had no problem with them. They're delicate, but we figured out how to do it. Um, we go in and get them. We feed train them. They feed train real well. And we get, uh, oh, gosh, last five years, I bet you we're getting anywhere from 75 to 90 percent of the return from back. All right. I waited another, and it happened one year, by the way. <clears throat> Three years ago, when it was time to go bring them in, both my parents tried to die. Okay, <laughs> they both lived thankfully, but I was gone for a couple of weeks. I mean, close kid, had to take care of him, travel and all that kind of stuff. Had to get him moved, moved to Dayton after they got out of the hospitals from Dayton to Columbus or anything. I had to wait two weeks, go in two weeks later, and basically all gone. And I had seen them two weeks earlier. So that just tells you when the food goes, it goes. Uh, fry harvest, a lot of fun. I haven't had Matt up for that yet. Sometime we'll get to him for that. Oh, you've seen it at uh, Jim's, though. Same thing. We have a 150 foot same, a foot tall, same, eight inch mesh. It's like pulling a wall. You go very, very slowly, which is a good thing because you, those fry, you know, you want to slowly move them to the other one end of the pond. You don't want to just roar down the length of the pond and smash them all up against the same. So if it's eight inch mesh, you can't roar down the length of the pond. It just it doesn't happen. We do not count fish prior to stocking into the tanks. I talked a little bit about down there, too much stress. We basically subsample a couple of hundred fry. I know how many per pound. If I want 40,000 to a pond, I know how many pounds have to go out. Just like you saw down there. Just a little quick. Uh, when we take them to the building, we use five gallon buckets for the pond. I guess our ponds are right by the building, so we're not traveling any distance, okay? Uh, no more than a couple of pounds of fry per one five gallon bucket. So that's a lot of trips between the ponds and, and stocking the feed training tanks. It's just the day gone. You just figure it's gone. And that's when a gator comes in. Handy. Indoor feed training typically begins about May 15th. Okay, it was a little later this year. Cold April set them back. They did try to catch up. 
with that warm bay, but it was closer to, I want to say the 21st or something like that. 24 hour low light conditions with lights just above the tanks. Perch really feed train well at night under low light. That's the way to do it. Temperatures of 68 to 76, usually not a problem, except for this year. Yeah, those tanks got warm this year in May. But we survived it. <laughs> we survived it. I don't stock any more than 25 per gallon fry. So I got a thousand gallon tank, you saw it sitting there. I will put about 25,000 fry into that tank for feed training. If you get over 25 fry, you get into trouble. Low flow rates initially. We don't want to swim them to death when they first come in. But as they grow, we increase the rates. As they grow, they can swim better and they're eating more feed. Um, oxygen levels, nitrite, although I've never seen much nitrite ammonia, all indicators <coughs> when to increase flow rates. So I'm, I'm doing that about every, I'm doing it every day. So when I start to see that, and the oxygen was a real challenge this year, it was a real challenge. And it wasn't a function of what was going on in tanks. The pond source coming was so warm this year, warm water holds less oxygen, right? We just didn't have the ambient incoming oxygen and we had to run aerators, extra aerators. It was a real challenge. I was real happy when I took him back out last Sunday, let me tell you. Real happy, I was tired. So you can see the, the feed training. Uh, one thing, I'll talk a little bit about it. I'll tell you what this is on the back here at some uh, before long. But you can see the lights. Obviously, this picture is in the daytime, but the lights are on all day, although that one looked like it burned a bulb out on me. No, that one wasn't used that year. And you can see where our automatic feeders are up, up there. That's the bigger tanks there. There's a night picture, it's not very good. I turned the lights up a little bit so that we'd have some contrast when I took my picture. But, uh, I have seen everything in these tanks, I mean, not in the tanks. Although I have. Um, I have found dead raccoons in there. Mm. Uh, that, I don't know how that falls in there drowns, but you're siphoning the tank the next day and you're what the heck is that down there? It's like a big old wet coat down there and you finally have to get a dead, <laughs> dead raccoon. That's happened twice. Came in one morning, the neighbor's cat was swimming in circles, couldn't get out. <laughs> it's always fun. Uh, indoor feed training, uh, we mix krill powder and artificial meal for five to seven days. So in other words, in those belt feeders, goes a mixture of these two, krill. I actually now mix uh, powdered uh, Egg yolk too. That seems to really help. Is that a three-one ratio? No, no. I go half to half. Some people will start 100% krill mill out of the gate, but I don't. By the way, you can't buy the krill meal anymore to use directly. It's illegal according to feds. So you have to buy krill flakes and make it in the meal yourself. So you use a blender. Buy one. Do not use your wife's and take it back. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, we started a high rate of feed for the first couple of days and then down to 20%. Uh, we never get to day 21 anymore. These things are feed training. I don't know if it's genetics or what, but day 14, they are feeding like 15 years ago they did it day 21. So again, I get tired from old age, so I take them out pretty when I get a chance. Um, this last bullet here is important because this is what really changed the, the story for us. Uh, we use one or two belt feeders per tank for continuous feeding. Only about half the feed for the day goes into those belt feeders. The other half I hand feed. It's called blizzard feeding. This would be for bluegill, bass, anything. The reason is, is if you just use belt feeders by the light, there'll be a group that sets up shop. They're the dominance. And everybody else is out on the edge and doesn't get as much feed. And about day seven to day 10, you'll know because they start dying in mass and you panic. Uh, when we started blizzard feeding, our mortality rate went down to less than 1%. So I go out there, this is what retirement helped with, by the way. I could go down six to eight times a day. It really, really changed the, the story for us. Daily chores, you got to siphon the tanks daily to remove feces and eat your feet. you got to. And that also gives you an estimate of how many dead fish might be in the tank. Okay? If you want to see ammonia spike, skip a day when you're feeding. Okay. It will spike the next day. You wonder, why aren't they eating so good? In fact, this year, because it was so warm, I was actually siphoning twice a day. 
because I didn't want to go into the night with a bunch of organics on the bottom of the tanks. When is oxygen lowest in the pond coming in? During the night. So I was getting rid of that black gunk of organics. So you got to estimate mortality. Again, I, ever since we blizzard feed, we have virtually no mortality anymore, um, unless it's going into the tummy of somebody else. Uh, you got to look at your belt feeders. And by the way, 24 hours, they don't last 24 hours. If you get 20, you're doing well. That's not the end of the world. I, feed, I load mine up about 3 in the afternoon. 3 to 4 in the afternoon. And you do need to monitor water quality. Are they feed trained? When you see them doing this, in other words, feed just dropped down. When you see them doing this, where they're congregating like that and boiling and carrying you're well on the road to having them feed trained. I don't care what species. Once they start doing that, they do that. And I showed that picture where you get a bunch of crap. One picture showed a lot over on the wall of the tank. And you're blizzard feeding, you can't see. Can't be that precise. You're just gonna throw stuff up on the ledge, and the lid, it's just the way it happens. <laughs> but it's worth doing. So that's, a, that in essence is a feed that has just splashed. <laughs> Yeah, and they're up there boiling. Right. Yep. Yep. And that's during the day. When you get them doing that during the day, you're, you're in great shape. First year production, again, this is what I do to grow those four to five, five to sevens for Jenny and whoever else and things. Okay, you only, we put about 40,000 one to one and a half inch feed train fingerlings back to a pond per acre. We're trying something different this year. If you come to the workshop, well, you mostly will be in. Matt will explain what we're doing. We're really pushing the envelope this year. Uh, block seine. Okay, I got a one acre pond. So I put up a block seine right there. And those fish go in that corner. Okay, I don't want them scattering in that one acre pond real quick. I put them in that corner. Now, do they all stay behind here? No, they don't. They figure out how to get to the other side. But what they do is, is that's a piece of structure. They cruise up and down that net. You can watch them. So that net's in there for about a week. And then they get real used to the lights, because there's lights on there and everything. And then I can pull the blocks and they stay there. Uh, two belt feeders on a small platform for continuous feeding. Again, about half goes into the feeders initially. And then I'm broadcasting a couple times a day, the rest of it, getting them used to me. They will eventually literally know when my truck pulls up. They literally, in about eh, six to seven weeks when they get about this big, they literally, you can see them coming. They feel the vibration of the truck. And we generally keep the feeders in place for about two weeks. Over the course of two weeks, the amount going into the automatic feeders dwindles. So after about two to two and a half weeks, there's no more feed in the feeders. It's all hand feeding, morning and evening. But I leave it in there with the lights on for a while to keep them in the corner. Now, you got some like the Browns have smaller ponds, third acre, quarter acre ponds. Like up here, there you could probably just would need to have a, a block seine on a corner. They're going to find it. It's not that far. So there's an example of what it is. Uh, this pond's not quite full yet, but it's in the process of filling. So that's what it looks like uh, when, we're, when we go back out. Now I'm real happy when I'm at this point. I sleep nights. When they're in the tanks, I don't sleep too well. My wife won't even want me. So I'm in the spare bedroom. <laughs> So first year feeding, once we get them back out of the ponds, 10 to 15% uh, of the weight that goes back. Uh, again, I talked about that, less and less. Uh, then we go to satiation feeding, okay? You can't, you want to record the amount of feed you're throwing, you're putting into the pond, you're feeding, but you don't control mortality and growth, so this set ration doesn't work well in ponds like you could in aquaponics or RAS where you can take subsamples and know what the growth is and what the poundage is in that tank. If you wanted to feed 3% body weight per day in a tank, you can do it. In a pond, you know, Mother Nature changes things and, and it's tough to do. This is what our length frequency looks at the end of the first year. This is what we'll be comparing the research data against you know, this fall with what Matt's trying to do. Um, so, you, you know, we want a lot of, of four to seven inch fish. Uh, we don't like a lot of this stuff. I do have a market for, for the three to fours. Uh, these guys apparently went in and decided I don't like feed anymore and never stayed on feed. But, you know, luckily that's not bad to be honest with you. 
Any questions real quick before we turn over to Matt? This is something that should have been talked about in January, but we all know the weather that we had and kind of threw us behind because we ended up having to cancel that with uh, you know, the very late winter that we ended up having. Uh, did everybody, I know there were a few people that did make it to Doug and Jenny's back in March, I believe. Uh, or at least two or three of them. So at the start of that talk, I talked about um, basically the principles of aquaculture and aquaponics just as a whole broad overview, just like a lot of this stuff is. ABC is not supposed to be 100% in depth, it's to give you a broad range of a lot of different things, both from the biology and the economic and marketing standpoint. The first couple slides I hit on was basically a quick overview of, uh, of US and world aquaculture. And so basically, wasn't 100% making, making sure if we were gonna have time to pull this back in, uh, and luckily we did. So this is basically an expanded view over those few slides that I gave you all uh, a few months back. So we'll reiterate on a few of those and then expand on some of the principles and the concepts that we discussed. And a lot of this is stuff that uh, y'all already know or else you wouldn't be here, right? You understand that we have a seafood deficit, you understand that it's huge and we want to play our own part. We want to be environmentally sustainable and uh, also economically sustainable and yada, yada, yada. And that's why y'all are sitting here on a Saturday morning rather than tending your gardens or sit by the pool or whatever it is you might be doing that day. So this is just an overview. I've got until 12 o'clock, but if y'all have questions, feel free to let me know. It's nothing uh, too in depth and, and, and too crazy. Uh, but once again, this was supposed to be mostly a January PowerPoint, so some of the stuff we'll show is rudimentary and take you back to your roots to remember what we're talking about. A lot of times we always just call this fish farming, but we have people in this room that are not fish farmers they're aquaculturists, but there might be shrimp farmers, they might be uh, a bunch of other stuff that I'll talk about. Uh, but of course, we're just rearing these animals in a controlled environment, uh, whether that's just uh, rearing them or it's actually the breeding as we heard earlier and the feed training and that sort of thing, uh, all the way up to harvesting. But it is aquatic organisms and we don't just like to call it just fish farm because we know if we think about the big picture and luckily in Ohio, we have some salt and fresh water uh, shrimp folks as well but we know just within Ohio it's not just fish and those are very uh, what constitutes a fish is, is very specific so we always want to make sure that we talk about it uh, kind of in a broad range because that's one of the benefits uh, of this type of industry is that it is so highly diverse not just the different types of systems but the uh, hundreds and thousands of different types of uh, fish species that we or aquatic species that we can grow and we all know that there's well over 30,000 different species and you can better believe that as we start to fully e exploit uh, different types of natural fisheries, we're gonna look at different ways to culture animals that we were never culturing before. Isn't and of course in this picture. Isn't there a facility that grows corals as well? Would that be considered aquaculture too? Yeah, so on the bottom right, those are that's a, a, a type of seaweed, so I, any aquatic plants, anything like that, can, can really be constituted as an aquaculture product. And I'll get to it in a minute, but I can go ahead and say now she was asking about growing corals. Um, a huge amount of the, um, a huge amount of aquaculture total from a biomass standpoint comes from your seaweeds like your kelps. Uh, there's huge, there's thousands of pounds of acre that you can pull in your near and, and slightly offshore aquaculture a standpoint, especially if you're going to do an IMTA system or something like that. Uh, but a lot of that's cultured overseas and especially um, uh, utilized by uh, the Japanese as well as the U.S. as well because a lot of the sushi that you eat, even if it's tuna that might be wild caught or whatever it may be, a lot of times that's wrapped in a seaweed. A lot of times that seaweed is farm raised, so that falls under aquaculture as well. And this particular picture, uh, this is by Dr. Jeff Limlin up in the Northeast, but um, he's just got shellfish there. Of course, we've got some seaweeds. Uh, and then this is more of what you, what most people think about as far as, unless you're on the coast, general aquaculture practices or, or species, that of course is just catfish being hauled up uh, when it's time for the processing. So then you get into your types of markets, not only you think about aquaculture, whether it be shellfish or, or, or whatever it may be, a lot of what y'all are interested in, and a lot of what basically all aquaculture interest has really exploded in 
is the food fish industry, of course, and that's that human consumption part. You know, we're tired of going to the store uh, or to the restaurant and seeing everything uh, come from overseas, come from an overexploited area, come from areas of unknown, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so a lot of people want to do their part in order to help uh, increase that. Um, you know, they want to do it all locally and, and come from the bottom up and really take care of their own, uh, and that's perfectly fine. But it's also important to remember that we have a whole host of different markets uh, that we can hit on. And a lot of your folks, uh, like Bill, hit strictly on uh, kind of the sport fish or your pond and lake management companies right now. But he's growing a species that can very easily, if we had the volume of production, to switch into a food fish industry. Or, of course, a lot of folks also diversify too. Um, we've got the Bells here who do uh, uh, some tilapia that can do some uh, for both food and then they can sp sell the smaller ones to golf courses, things like that to help with uh, algae control in, in their systems. So it's always great when you can help them diversify, have the same species that can hit several different types of markets depending on time of year or what's going on at that time. And then of course bait fish is coming from Arkansas, that was our, uh, by far one of our biggest industries. Uh, and we grow basically three different species that was uh, super popular. A lot of people don't think that's the stuff that you're putting them on the hook, especially a handful of years back when we were uh, scared with, uh, scared straight with VHS and Lake Erie and every, all of a sudden they start shutting down and you've got borders, you can't take bait from one area to the other, they have to be certified for this, that and the other, uh, and all of a sudden the regulations got extremely, extremely stringent. Well there are some quote unquote certifications, labels, things like that that have helped people continuously uh, ship species uh, to, to an area. And we all know if anyone likes to fish, how big the fishing industry is, not just in Lake Erie, but throughout the country and really throughout the world. And there are some of, uh, there are some folks in Arkansas who far, fall under this certified Arkansas bait fish that ship uh, all over the world as well. So once again, just kind of an overview, don't you know, whatever you're super highly interested in, that's great because you got to be passionate about that uh, and passionate about the species and what you want to do and what type of impacts you're interested in. But you also have to listen to the markets as we've heard a thousand times over from, from Christy and, uh, uh, and Chris as well. Uh, don't just be so honed in that you're going to grow that species uh, no matter what if you don't have a market to sell it. Here's, here's a variety of markets and if you can hit a species that hits on several of those, uh, then that's all the better. Of course, you've got the ornamental trade. Uh, you've got folks down at the Florida Aquaculture, Florida Tropical Aquaculture Lab, uh, who probably have a hundred different species, and every year they're coming up with new species that they're trying to grow. Uh, they just did uh, the blue tank right when the more movie Dory came out. They pretty much captively bred the first uh, uh, first blue tank. I was down there the other day, actually, and it's a, a beautiful fish. But that's just another part of that ornamental trade. And there's a lot of research, a lot of dollars spent into that sort of stuff. But we also know that these, you go to a Petco or a true saltwater store, and you see how much every individual fish is, it makes you start to wonder why you're selling them for 17 cents a, a, a fish if you're doing a, maybe a perch or something like that. Now I mentioned your shellfish. We all know the crustaceans, and we'll hear a lot more about those guys in a little bit. And then, of course, environmental remediation here in, uh, in um, uh, the state of Ohio, such as your Tripoli grass carp, which are often marketed by your pond and lake management company that you can grow them and sell them, as well as Nile tilapia, too. Uh, just some of the species that we do culture here. Once again, this is more of a January talk, but we can't help Mother Nature. Some of the stuff we look at, uh, both species and collector groups, are things like catfish, uh, shellfish, rainbow trout. Uh, largemouth bass, tilapia, hydrostrike bass, yellow perch, salmon, freshwater prawn, uh, and saltwater now, as well as your various seaweeds or kelps and things of that nature. And this is specifically for food, however there are certainly caveats with things like rainbow trout. If you have a, uh, if you have weight, if you have more money than since you're going to grow these, you know, buy these rainbow trout when they're real small and they actually end up being bait for things like your largemouth bass and things like that, that's a very expensive hobby. Of course, game fish can be everything. Bass, we're always doing multiples of species. Brim, we're doing um, at least a half a dozen, a half, a half a dozen different species. And of course, yellow perch, trout, things that I've already mentioned. Uh, and then of course, depending on where you are, you might be interested in things like walleye uh, and, and 
Muskie. Let's get an overview of, of the United States and a lot of the stuff we might see here. And then lastly, I won't spend much time on it, but here's some of the ones that you'll see uh, commonly cultured. Kind of the, uh, the top three will be your golden shiners, fathead minnows, and goldfish. Uh, and then from there, it kind of drops off precipitously as far as uh, what the interest lies. And that, of course, depends on where you are, uh, what your state regulations allow, and things of that nature. And then, of course, another one we got along with food, and she'll begin here later, uh, and just as another one that I always like to hit on, of course, is your paddlefish uh, that we've got. Uh, one of our, uh, one of the OAA members uh, cultures your paddlefish both for food uh, and has her own processing facility as well, as well as selling the caviar through e-commerce and packaging it up and selling it that way. So just kind of a, a, a quick preliminary part and then we'll shift more to the kind of what I call more or less the blue marble. So we're looking at a worldwide view of what's going on. Uh, and there will be basically a whole bunch of figures and a bunch of stats and you pick up what you want. Uh, the good part is, is you can go back uh, whenever you want to and, and look at this again or just ask us and we'll uh, certainly talk some more about it. What we see is uh, Asia definitely dominates and, and I think this is one of the slides that we discussed. We're doing about 89% of all production throughout the world. And we'll hear about the amount of pounds and the economic impact uh, and the farm gate value of what com comes from that, uh, with what comes worldwide, and then all you gotta do is 89% of that strictly for uh, certain continents. And then within that, we've got China, Indonesia, and Vietnam uh, really uh, taking off within Asia. And it's not exclusively, I thought I took that word out, but it's mostly uh, a, a lot of pond culture stuff, and you also have a lot of cage culture on your large rivers as well. And that's where the bulk of the production is going to be. A lot of what you see uh, will use uh, surface water used in production, and some of the quote-unquote certifications that you have to be a part of, uh, even in the United States, a lot of times they don't even let you use surface water. You have to use groundwater or some type of treated water in order to be a part of those certifications. And we all know why, and that's because there can be pathogens, there can be non-natives, there can be a whole host of, uh, of algaes that are definitely native, but it can be detrimental to your system. Uh, it can cause off flavoring and all those types of things. Uh, we never know about any pollutants that are in that. That surface water could be lake or creek water or river water, whatever it may be. And of course, we also have a much more stringent environmental regulation than a lot of countries as well. So even whether it be for regulations uh, or whether it be uh, for labeling purposes and wanting to sell to particular markets, you're gonna have to be careful as far as what type of, of water you're using, but a lot of that is surface water. And then uh, what's uh, certainly one of the most popular are your various carp species. You also have, that's imported into the United States, a lot of your catfish-like uh, species. So they're not what we consider catfish, uh, but they call them catfish-like uh, species. And then tilapia and shrimp, and, and those are your big ones from, uh, from Asia. So the value of aquaculture total, uh, as of right now, is about 166 billion. Uh, and that's just farm gate, that's not including any economic multipliers or anything added on top of that. Uh, which of course we know uh, makes the number a whole lot larger, uh, but it is quite difficult with something like aquaculture, uh, and it's usually specific to a certain market or a certain species to help with that. And we're looking at over 102 million metric tons right now, and then as uh, an annual increase, we're looking at about 6%, which is a pretty impressive increase from a worldwide view. Unfortunately, in the last bullet, we do see some stagnant or declining areas um, within the United States and worldwide. And I'll talk a little bit about the United States and what it's looked like really over the last 30 years with a quick little graph. One of the important things to focus on is that they're increasing it, uh, estimating uh, that it, just by 2030, which sounds like a long way away, but when you realize we're halfway through 2018, it's not far at all. Uh, they're estimating a, a, about a double uh, amount of uh, uh, aquaculture <coughs> value that'll be on the farm gate side. Once again, it doesn't include any economic multipliers attached to it. Basically, except for the last bullet point, we just see a lot of positive growth, uh, which is great. That's what we hear a lot about, but we also, at the very end, talk a little bit about the challenges, both uh, mostly from the state of Ohio and what challenges we see. And then just to give you an idea of some of the, uh, some of the way the production uh, looks like and different types of species that are cultured here, um, 
Top left is actually something that's highly invasive in the United States, that's snakehead culture. Um, they look a lot like bowfin or, or granola, if you know what those species are. Um, pretty good tasting fish, actually, but uh, and that's one of the species that culture on top of those others that we talked about, the catfish-like species and things of that nature. Uh, you have bullfrog culture down here in the bottom left. And then these two are actually the same operation. These are tilapia that are being cultured. Um, and these are, uh, it, it's hard to see, but these are all blue 55 gallon drums, basically holding this entire facility together with some, uh, with some metal rebar in between, uh, metal structures in between holding these cages up. And this is on, uh, it's not the Mekong River, but a major tributary to the Mekong, uh, where we all know that there's a, a huge population that lives on. Uh, so as the water flows through, it's coming this direction, it just flows through the entire system. But they're highly congregated, uh, or, or they're, it's a regular culture operation, uh, and the water's just flowing through on this side. Uh, and this is not the entire river, this is maybe one fifteenth of the width of the entire river between uh, this section right here with a little space in between and then another section on, on the other side as well. Um, and I always tell people you can definitely tell this is not made for uh, chunkier Americans because even I stand on the edge of it and you kind of feel it kind of topple a little bit, makes you a little nervous. Uh, but super, they are impressive operations. But once again, that's a surface water usage and we know a lot of folks like the ideas of of uh, groundwater and private water that's uh, fairly well protected. As far as the blue marble goes continuously, I'll go uh, for the next handful of slides through this. Uh, and once again, I think this is something that was already shown. But the blue, uh, the solid line is your aquaculture for human consumption. Uh, and once again, that's just human consumption. We already learned that there are huge sport fish markets, ornamental markets, things of that nature that doesn't, uh, that's not included in here. But we can see from 1991 projected out to 2025, we see a fairly high increase as far as uh, over the last few decades, uh, what's going on um, with aquaculture production versus capture fisheries for human consumption, which is the dotted line right here. And then uh, total capture fisheries has, has virtually sat stagnant uh, for quite a long time. I think this has been talked about already, but we already know that there are a lot of, not just in this presentation, but in, in several of the other presentations. Uh, it's very well known that over half of our uh, species that we're harvesting from our oceans is overexploited. And there is a ton of money spent by NOAA um, and your state agencies, your sea grants, and, uh, and FAO and beyond, helping to go and understand what's going on with our uh, capture fisheries, how to best allow these guys to rebound, and one of the ways it's certainly going to be, it has been, and will continually be, uh, aquaculture. So it, it's certainly promising as far as a worldwide view, as, as far as what we're looking at. And then to give you a different idea, uh, uh, basically a different view of a, of a similar concept, or the uh, similar, utilizing the same data in, in a slightly different way, we can see in about 2014, that's where we get about that 170 million metric tons or so. Uh, but of course, you can see this orange part all being uh, capture fisheries and, and really uh, kind of plateauing off. And then aquacultures, of course, as we expect, just going to continually uh, increase. Everyone confused yet? Pretty simple. Aquaculture is increasing. We still got a lot of challenges to talk about it on the backside, though. Once again, same thing, kind of give us a better idea. The light blue being capture, the dark blue being aquaculture. We can kind of see this little bit bell curve of what's uh, come down a little bit. However, we're still, uh, I think on average, a little over 6% as far as our, our annual growth and what's going on. But it gives you an idea. We've actually saw a decline from 2000, 2009 as far as the total captures. And that, that's partially because uh, we're paying attention more, but that's also because technology is advancing our ability to model and predict um, uh, predict the status of our oceans is getting better and better and better. So we're gonna help fine tune those a little bit more. And then I won't go too far into this, but basically we all know that we're projecting a whole lot of people. Uh, and everyone just thinks we're eventually gonna have a big plague and we're all gonna, we're gonna lose a huge population or we're gonna have to do this and the other. Realistically, what's most likely going to happen is our technology is going to, just going to get better and better and better and we're going to produce more and more fish on a smaller acreage, not just fish, but anything. 
we're going to get better at producing as technology becomes cheaper, as we become more advanced. Uh, you know, we may have something like that, but realistically, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get better and better at doing what we've done every single day. Necessity is the mother of all inventions, and we've heard that a bunch of times. More on the blue marble. This is a pretty little document that came out. There's a lot of modeling and things like that, but it gives you a lot of pretty graphs. Uh, this is the World Bank. It was actually done in 2013 by a bunch of uh, a bunch of folks, including the FAO. Uh, but basically, it's projecting out the prospects for fisheries and aquaculture. Uh, uh, you know, kind of. Um, oops. Skip on to that. Going back to the over, not going back, skipping through just to their executive summary and their, and their overall lessons. Once again, a lot of this is done by modeling and that's part of it, it's projections. We won't know until we actually get there where we're looking, but just from a quick, couple quick lines, based on their modeling exercises that they talked a few pages above that, um, and their scenario analysis, it's clear aquaculture is gonna continue. While the total fish supply will likely equal uh, be split by capture in aquaculture about 2030, which uh, we know aquaculture has surpassed because this is a little bit dated, uh, it still predicts that we're going to uh, dominate the global fish supply. Uh, once again, all of this is just positive stuff showing that we're going in the right way uh, and that aquaculture is going to continually be a big part of it. Whether us specifically or as a, an actual person is a part of it now, it's going to continue on. And then I, I uh, revert back quickly in the very first slide. Uh, I did say, uh, you know, this talk, a similar talk was actually given by Bill, which was the talk that was pulled from, uh, from Dr. Chris Weeks, who used to be in the, uh, the Regional Aquaculture Extension Specialist. I uh, just kind of looked over his to get an idea of what was talked about in ABC1 so that we're reiterating a lot of the, new st uh, a lot of the same stuff, with, but with some new stuff as well. And this was a slide that I saw in there that was pretty uh, impressive. It's Dr. Leslie. Uh, met him last year, earlier this year for the first time, but he's up in the Northeast. Uh, and he gave a New England aquarium uh, presentation that was uh, quite interesting. And this is basically uh, on one of his slides, of course, talks about, and it is a little fuzzy, but a pound of body bottom mass as far as what it takes uh, uh, to produce, so you've got the feed needed to produce that animal. Of course, it decreases, and we've all heard uh, that fish are quite efficient at uh, converting the feed that we're feeding to the animals uh, to actual body mass. So that 1.1, it's 1.1 pounds of feed, um, making one pound of, of biomass. Um, and of course, that's what we're looking for, the broiler chicken, the pigs, and the cattle as well. And then on top of that, you see the uh, uh, the graph in the back depicting what your differences are in uh, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen as well. So not only that is it's uh, a lot of times can be a lot more uh, not just economically uh, sustainable to have a lower feed conversion ratio, but a lot more environmentally friendly. Uh, of course, that depends on what goes into those feeds and things of that nature. Uh, but it's also it's always nice to see. Uh, things that we're particularly worried with uh, in areas around the Great Lakes when we're worried about harmful algal blooms and things of that nature to make sure that a lot of those numbers are lower and that's uh, basically all the graphs is depicted is with the lower nitrogen and phosphorus inputs we're still getting a great feed conversion ratio and producing uh, a healthy protein animal regardless of what if it's a fish or a shrimp or, or whatever you're still able to produce that uh, really in a more environmentally friendly way. So it's kind of your global view and then a quick recap and then we'll go into our um, uh, into the US production so catfish if you didn't know um, I always recommend people kind of and I, I reiterate this at the end gets outside of your bubble a lot of people never leave their city or their county um, so I appreciate you at least coming down to Pike County um, but there's also only so much that Ohio aquaculture is going to provide you in a, in a, uh, in a even a a regional view. There's so much going on just in our region that you'll never see if you never bother to, to look outside, whether it's physically going to another state association meeting or researching on their website, uh, their particular YouTube videos, whatever it may be, but there's a lot going on. So if you did know, catfish is by far our number one producer, uh, producing species. However, trout is huge, tilapia is uh, uh, fairly small, but it's a, a decent uh, organization uh, and industry in the United States. 
I should have, if we're kind of putting this in decreasing order, hybrid striped bass should be above that. We've got a large hybrid striped bass industry. Um, and a lot of this is for uh, food fish and it's sent to white tablecloth markets, things of that nature. Uh, there's also folks that are focusing more on uh, the striped bass as well, going back not just to the hybrid, but to the pier. And then in general, we produce a lot of bait fish. We produce a lot of sport fish and uh, shellfish is one of the things that has, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago was extremely low, uh, but if you live on the coast, there's kind of a, and I'll get to it in a minute, kind of a not my backyard attitude, depending on where you're living, uh, but the shellfish industry is absolutely exploding as well as the, uh, uh, as well as those seaweeds as we talked about. There's a ton of it being produced now in states like Rhode Island and things that we might not necessarily think about, but those are an industry where, although we've seen some stagnant industries in some, that's an industry that is uh, absolutely exploding and we'll just see more and more of that happen over time. So as far as um, our deficit, so as far as natural resources go, they always say we're second behind uh, crude oil. So as far as natural resources, anything you can think of, it's hard to imagine seafood just sitting just second at that. So we're looking at 91% of it being imported. Uh, and once again, I reiterate, that's kind of why a lot of you are probably here. You're interested in the food fish market, not necessarily for uh, environmental remediation, bait fish, whatever it may be. Over $11 billion annually, uh, and then we've just seen that steadily decline. Unfortunately, it's been quite a while since we've made any dent in that. We're doing our best to hold on as good as we can. Um, and once again, I'll get into the challenges and the reasons why in a little bit. The top three that were important really by far is shrimp, uh, and then we're looking at uh, your salmon and tilapia being some of your other higher ones. Uh, but if we're looking at each person in the United States eating about, depending on what year you're looking at, around 15.4 pounds of seafood uh, per person every single year, and three quarters of that's gonna be shrimp most likely. Uh, you eat a ton of shrimp. If you're a lobster, all you can eat for 17 bucks, heck yeah. The problem is it's all imported. That's being produced here. None of our farmers could grow it anywhere near uh, the price that, that someone could import it for. Just a lot cheaper that way. And as far as, and, and to get back to that about 15.4 pounds, I think it's about 37 pounds of chicken. To give you an idea about how many pounds we eat, I think we're about 37 pounds of chicken per person per year. So we're, we're at about half, which is not a tenth, but it's still not great. We all <laughs> We all know that we've got our uh, medical doctors screaming at us to eat these, uh, these uh, uh, good omegas and, and help our bodies uh, and, and be healthier human beings in general. And we're growing about, uh, I'm sorry, we're consuming about five billion pounds uh, as a country. So basically we eat it, we eat a ton of it. We're second, I think, only behind maybe uh, Japan as far as what we're eating and what we're importing, uh, but we're just not growing it here. It's, it's, a, it's a sad reality, but it's also an opportunity. And the opportunity is there. You also have to understand the challenges and what it takes to overcome those. And just a quick graph from the FAO to give you an idea. Uh, you know, this is a quick depiction of what we already saw. For those of you who are working on your marketing schemes or marketing and everything else to, to, help, your, to help your business, it's important, it's important to show things like this, where as we continue on to 2030, and beyond what that's going to gradually look like. So a lot of people still have a negative connotation of what aquaculture means. However, I do think we are seeing more and more of a shift and more people understand what it takes uh, and what actually goes behind an aquaculture business and what goes on at the farms. And I think a lot of that's just going to come with more and more transparency as we start to educate the millennials and everyone else that's coming up. But it's important to use these graphs that are from these large nonprofit organizations uh, or from USDA or whoever to help say, look, this is what the da data show. Uh, I, I really want this restaurant you to be on board for all these types of reasons because it's just going to continue. Uh, and whether you like it or not, more and more stuff that you start to bring uh, uh, into your restaurant is going to be farmed whether you like it or not. So buy it locally from down the street for me rather than all this other food. Uh, we all understand the impediments that go along with that. And so to give you an idea of some of the stagnant stuff that we have seen, I mentioned that shellfish industry is really exploding. 
but we have seen uh, a general trend since about 2003 or so, uh, really about 2011, uh, I'm sorry, 2001, kind of a general decline. So this uh, dashed line right here is our total aquaculture production. And then the solid line below that's kind of a purple line is your catfish production. I mentioned them being our largest industry and you can certainly see them moving that trend line. So I said, uh, while there's many industries, it's clear that the catfish industry is the driving factor. We've got, we sell over 24 different species here in the state of Ohio. We sell uh, well over a couple hundred uh, in the United States. But if you're a small percentage of that, you're gonna be a small driver in the fact of what our numbers look like. Uh, and when Congress and everyone else starts to look at things, they're gonna look at the data and look at us compared to other ag industries. How much do I really need to listen to these guys if they're small in the total pool? So we always wanna uplift each other and things of that nature because as we drive and kind of unify ourselves, no matter the system, no matter the species, no matter the location, uh, it's kind of a one voice thing. What's good for one can be good for all for sure. But you kind of see that general decline. It has to, uh, uh, it has plateaued a little bit. We're not seeing quite a, a, a crash anymore. And a lot of the reasons here uh, are a bunch of, including feed, dealing with exports or dealing with imports and things of that nature. So within the United States, a few of the labels that you might see um, in the United States, and once again, these aren't all inclusive or anything like that. But some of the stuff you see is your best aquaculture practices, which is actually where Chris Weeks is, uh, is focusing his efforts on now. Um, if you do decide to get into the bait fish or the sport fish industry, uh, a lot of times you might see Arkansas certified uh, uh, bait fish being imported in the state, it might be something you purchase from. USDA organic, we all know that we don't have organic certification for our fish, but if you're doing an aquaponic operation, there's still a lot of hee hauling and back and forth as far as what's going on. We do have some USDA organic aquaponic uh, enterprises, uh, and as far as I know, I think it's a lot harder, but I think it is still uh, a possibility. The last time y'all were here, I handed out, uh, if you wanted them, uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium always does the seafood watch, uh, and this is the newest one. If you want to get it, you're welcome to it, but it gives you an idea of the, basically the, uh, the good, bad, and the ugly, and then the countries of origin for those that are good, bad, and the ugly. So a shrimp might be a very red, stay away from, from this country, or it might be a very green, purchase all you can, eat all you can, no hesitations from this country. It just gives you an idea. Um, the Marine, uh, uh, Marine Stewardship Council, you have things like U.S. farm-raised catfish, uh, and then of course, as far as labeling, we were talking about in Ohio, what type of aquaculture labeling do we have uh, in order to help uplift us all? Once again, regardless of how many species we've got, how it's grown, whatever, uh, kind of the one voice thing. Uh, right now, a lot of your farmers are Ohio proud, but I think that's also a part in the future of this aquaculture cooperative is to hopefully get something even more uh, robust than that and more appealing and directly saying, this is not just Ohio Proud, this is Ohio Proud Aquaculture Products. Of course, that's not gonna be the name, but give you that idea uh, and, and so that these products can actually be labeled. Of course, Ashton is in the back and we can talk about that uh, uh, later, but it is gonna start as more as a, a, a feed cooperative because it's kind of your little hanging fruit uh, as it gets developed, but it'll certainly be one that's uh, an avenue in the future along with processing and all those types of things. And the Monterey Bay is, uh, uh, is one that a lot of people, it's the one that's got a, a ton of public interest. Um, there's an app on your phone, you can go to their website, you can hand out these little documents. There's a reason they make these small, they want you to keep it in your wallet, they want you to keep it in your purse, and when you go to the grocery store or the restaurant, you're looking at these types of things and keeping them on your persons. Uh, and then, just in May, actually, of this year, we got Red Lobster announcing on Twitter. Now they're a part of the Monterey Bay thing because even they, they're, they're not gonna dive into something that they don't see has gained a substantial amount of traction with the uh, general consumer. So if you are raising a product that's completely green on here, you use that as part of your marketing. You use that to help you uh, stand out from the crowd rather than just being just another shrimp or just another whatever you may be growing. Not going through this because I did this uh, pretty heavily at, at, um, at uh, Doug and Jenny's, but to give you an overview if you weren't here, and I took out a ton of slides. Uh, one of the things we've got here are earthen levees. 
Uh, and I did take it off, but you know, all of this right here, basically uh, ponds, they're growing about a billion uh, gold shiners here at this market. These are earthen levee or watershed ponds. Watershed's very common in uh, some of your uh, catfish industries. You got your recirculating systems, you got your bioflock systems that are going to be hit on heavy, uh, heavily later. They, of course, have our aquaponic system uh, uh, that's provided by Doug and Jenny. Most of your trout is going to be produced and uh, flow through systems, either in uh, places like Idaho, uh, but you also have a substantial amount of producers in uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina as well. And then, of course, whether it be offshore or near shore, uh, we have uh, cage culture uh, operations as well as the shellfish industry. Uh, that's Dr. Bill Walton, who's kind of my counterpart down at Auburn. He's down in South Auburn. Uh, uh, he does a lot of the shellfish work that's uh, going on as the Gulf of Mexico starts to open up to, uh, uh, to various types of enterprises uh, that want to take advantage of, uh, of the Gulf and, and still protect the, protect the environment. Uh, and of course, gives you an idea of that's a Pacific bluefin tuna, uh, but give you an idea of that guy's little boat, kind of the scale of a lot of what you're looking at. But unfortunately, is a very controversial topic, one that we still have to deal with here because we're worried about the Great Lakes and protecting those. So a lot of people still have a not in my backyard attitude, depending on where you are. But you go to the science, such as lower nitrogen or phosphorus uh, uh, rates being uh, uh, produced in the system. And of course, if you're using a recirculating system or an indoor system, a lot of times you're going to fall under, if you're, if you're really big, uh, you're going to be falling under EPA, uh, which we all technically fall under EPA. It's just whether or not they want to constrain us to, and, and make us remediate the water before it gets discharged. But it's a, a lot easier, a lot easier. It's a, it's a bad term, but uh, we have ways of remediating the water before it's discharged. So a lot of the not my backyard attitude can be amended uh, and, and changed a little bit. So what's going on in Ohio? I think I'm getting fairly close to the off questions, let me know. We're certainly one of the stronger in the Midwest, so we kind of did the world view, we did the Ohio, or we did the US view, and now we'll kind of look quickly at, uh, at Ohio uh, in particular. We are one of the uh, uh, only two states that did have positive growth in between the last, uh, in between the last uh, uh, censuses, and I'll get more, to, uh, more on that in just a minute. Uh, the other one actually being Iowa. So everyone else, uh, no matter, you know, Wisconsin has a huge aquaculture uh, industry and, and some of these larger, I think we'll definitely see some changes because we do have some multi-multi-million dollar industries taking off uh, and hopefully taking off and, and, and doing well in the Midwest. We'll certainly see a shift as they start to produce a decent amount of poundage as far as who increases uh, just based on one individual farm uh, that we might see. Uh, but from 25, uh, 2005 to 2013, we were uh, one of two that really uh, were continuously on an incline. Every other state, uh, and that's in the Midwest, every other state was either uh, not growing at all or actually declining as far as either the number of farms or the, uh, the farm gate uh, sales period. Of course, uh, part of this is actually pulled from another presentation too, but community universities and state associations, a lot of you were large about bass. Uh, perch, you're going to see Bill's facility in July. You also look at the tilapia, bluegill, uh, and brim in general. Uh, if you don't know, brim is a very generalized term, or you just call them panfish, um, but that could be crappie or bluegill or hybrid bluegill, red or sunfish, uh, a whole host of species. Uh, and then, of course, trout, uh, and I'll uh, show you a graph here uh, on the very next slide for that guy. Uh, and then prawn is another one that's uh, still there, nowhere near as prominent as it was uh, in the United States even 10 years ago, uh, but it certainly deserves still on the radar, radar for the state of Ohio. Very small print, don't expect you to, uh, to look at this and memorize this. There is, uh, it's of course, it's run by USDA, uh, and it's a census uh, that everyone has to fill out regardless. It is mandated that if you're a farmer and you're producing that you fill this out. If not, uh, you know, they can track you down. Uh, well, basically, you've got the census of ag, and then what always comes two years after that is the census of aquaculture. And they do, of course, a whole bunch of industries, but specifically, they'll do a more in-depth review uh, and they produce a large document specifically for uh, aquaculture. And the last one we had was in 2013. This 2017, we just finished up the um, census of agriculture for 2017. Everyone, if you're already producing, you received this, you should have filled it out and submitted it. 
but two years after that, uh, we ought to have a census of aquaculture be developed and, and produced out too. Unfortunately, it's not an annual thing, um, but for 2018, we'll probably have the census of aquaculture 2019 or 2020 um, uh, going out. But to give you a quick idea, you've got farms and then the sales, and those sales are uh, kind of what, uh, what the farms actually get, once again, out of the economic multipliers. Uh, it gives you an idea of uh, where Ohio sits, and this document is completely free. All you do is type census of aquaculture, and it can give you an idea of total, food fish, sport fish, bait fish, and then they'll break it down by species as well. Um, but what you will see, uh, particularly for states like Ohio, who are, have smaller industries compared to a lot of other states, a lot of these you'll see, a, a, I think it's a D, because there's not enough information. If they were to reveal it, it would be one individual farm, and everyone kind of knows it's one farm who's the largest guy. And if they reveal it, uh, or girl, uh, and if they reveal that number. So it all goes into total, uh, but when you start breaking down by species or type, uh, you might see some Ds all throughout the page and wondering what's going on. Basically, there's not enough information because they are very particular about um, who's allowed to see, no one's allowed to see raw data except for those who are actually analyzing it. Uh, but they're certainly not one to put any of that information out. Uh, small graph, because I didn't want to pull it over, but uh, we're still looking at um, uh, first in yellow perch, important in the last census. Uh, we're uh, first in grass carp as far as what we're selling, a uh, number of uh, uh, fish we're selling. Prime, we're still about, uh, we're still tied for third, once again, as of 2013. Tilapia, we're sitting around ninth. Um, and then uh, trout, we're sitting at 16th. So we're still, uh, we do a decent amount of trout, but we're still substantially be uh, uh, behind uh, a lot of states. A lot of it has to deal with location, availability of resources, and things of that nature. <coughs> so what's Ohio doing? Mostly pond stocking. Uh, a lot more pond stocking is even desired, and we hear that all the time from our pond and lake management companies. Uh, but we do have folks like the OAA who uh, Bill can tell you about uh, his list of restaurants. Most of your uh, systems or most of your poundage is gonna come from your pond culture systems. Uh, and y'all just saw an example of, of bills a second ago. And the average is about a one acre pond here in the state of Ohio, uh, probably around the Midwest as well, uh, which may not mean anything to you until you go down south and see a, a 10, 20, or seen a 100 acre um, uh, golden china farm or golden china pond. That's one pond of, of tens or twenties or, or a hundred of those of that size. Uh, so it gives you an idea of, of the scale, but it also makes it much more manageable and we are a lot better at managing these systems because we do have smaller ponds. And we do see a, the south generally looking at about a 10 acre pond. We're seeing more and more, 10 acres now, it was 20 acres. Now they've gone to 10. Now you're seeing a lot of guys go to five. And so a lot of these, you're just making more and more levees to make smaller and smaller ponds because they are so much easier to manage than something that's what we definitely consider a lake. Of course, we all know recirculating aquaculture systems uh, uh, continuing in popularity. People think it's more sustainable. Um, depending on what you've got, species, all those types of things, a lot of variables go in there. Uh, but in general, it can be more expensive to operate. And especially on your indoors, you've got to be very good at water quality. It's kind of imperative for a successful operation. Um, uh, but it certainly has the possibility of, uh, of being sustainable on its own. Uh, if you want to define sustainable, and then uh, it can also be utilized uh, seasonally as well. Agritourism's popular. we got the Ohio Fish and Shrimp Festival where Ohioans can sell their wares for free. Uh, and then opportunities for Ohioans, I just give the one slide, and this has been regurgitated since about 2010, I think, uh, for the Ohio Aquaculture Plan. The central Ohio is within 500 miles of about three quarters of the population. Uh, and everyone knows if you ever hauled fish before, or know anyone that's ever hauled fish before, whether it, uh, it doesn't have to be processed and sent, you know, eight hours away. It's very easy to send these animals live. You've got to deal with all the regulations, but it's very easy to send these animals uh, live uh, for a day's drive uh, and everything be just fine. It all depends on your markets, things of that nature. Um, but of course, we've got our own cities to provide, and we've heard that a lot of times as far as uh, the monster cities that we have just within the state of Ohio, and you never have to cross lines and worry about certain regulations. 
Uh, you got species that are allowed to be cultured in Ohio. I think we've gone over this before, but you got a Class A and Class B permit. So even within Ohio, depending on what you want to do, there's a lot of regs. Um, you've got a whole bunch of folks that are involved, uh, just with particularly the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Department of Ag, but you also have EPA, Army Corps of Engineers, things of that nature. And I'll bring these three pictures back up real quick because these are part of our challenges or impediments that are uh, that are here. So start at the top bullet point. Um, one of the biggest parts is to provide enough uh, to actually supply these markets, and we hear that a lot. Uh, they always say the chicken versus the egg, and I do believe that there are some aspects there, but uh, there are still certainly opportunities to help there. Shorter growing season, part of the reason people are so interested in our circulating systems. The cost of production of some species, especially if it is an animal that has to be feed trained, as we just heard the yellow perch have to be, the large mouth bass have to be, um, but other species, they just uh, basically accept a prepared diet right away. Of course, that's going to be substantially cheaper compared to you stocking them into the pond, pulling them back out at a certain age, uh, feed training them, and then stocking them back out. You know, that's a huge cost that you don't have to incur. So depending on the species that you've got, um, of course, capital, regulations, we could do the entire talk just on regulations if we wanted to, but we don't want to. Uh, and we grow a ton of species, but I don't think that should be any sort of impediment. That's more of a, uh, that could be a very positive thing. And then, especially talking about kind of cost of production of some species, a lot of what we see end up being is uh, the cost of feed. A lot of times that pushes uh, 40 to 50% of our total variable cost. Feed's very expensive, especially if it's an animal high up on the food chain. It's gotta be uh, fed with a higher protein or a high lipid diet. Uh, electricity cost, depending on what you've got going on, a lot of that time, uh, a lot of that then uh, is a huge cost uh, that your farm has to incur. And then it's hard to see with the lights on, um, but also just the cost of fingerlings is quite expensive, especially as I mentioned, if it is an animal that has to be featuring. I'm done right now, Jordan, give me just two seconds. Uh, I always do this because no matter what you're thinking about doing, you always got to think about your business plan. So I always uh, reiterate you know, how healthy is the crop. Well, if it's a soybean farm, yeah, it's a really healthy crop. It looks beautiful. Uh, and if you're trying to go, uh, you're only, if you're only so good at marketing, but you still got to get money from the bank, uh, a lot of people around here have no idea what aquaculture means. But they can step out of the soybean field and tell you pretty quickly how good this farmer is and, and, and what it looks like and uh, how good a farmer he is and how. Uh, likely he is that if he keeps doing what he's been doing, obviously he's done a good job. Uh, I'm probably going to get my money back plus his interest and everything else. But you take the same farm, uh, or you say, take the same farmer and take him to your Golden Shiner farm or your Perch farm or whatever else, uh, they're going to have a very hard time unless he comes on the day we're harvesting and get an idea of what's going on uh, at my farm. You know, this is, how are you going to be able to tell your survival, growth, diseases, things of that nature, and something that's completely underwater. Of course, being indoors and things of that nature certainly helps it somewhat if you can feed right on top of their head and they can watch it boil at the top. Uh, well, of course, that's a, uh, a lot easier to work with uh, folks there. Once again, I always recommend people kind of seeing the big picture and what's going on throughout the world. Uh, not just, don't get stuck just in your county, don't just get stuck in your city, whatever it may be. Uh, certainly go out and utilize the resources that are both free or some of these uh, the top three associations you do have to be uh, to pay to be members of. Um, the World Aquaculture Society is fantastic and if you happen to be a, a World Aquaculture Society member it gives you a great broad range of what's going on throughout the world. Uh, five bucks more gets, gets you the U.S. Aquaculture Society membership. Uh, super great little organizations. Of course we have uh, the, the OAA that ABC partners with as well. And then the Natural Aquaculture Association has just a ton of resources, um, whether this is for uh, kids, whether this is for the general consumer, uh, whether it is for uh, chefs. They have all sorts of uh, trifolds that uh, you can order from them, pass out if you're going to restaurants or wherever it may be. I'm out of time, but I'm gonna stick around for a little bit. Anyone have a quick question? Hey guys, uh, thanks for uh, staying for the last presentation before we go to the greenhouse. Um, my name is Ashton um, and I own the Ocean Spread Aquaculture with my family. Um, and uh, we're the first saltwater shrimp farm in Ohio according to the, not the USDA, uh, ODNR. Get them mixed up all the time. 
Um, this is my old facility. I don't have pictures of my outside of my new facility, but do not come to this one because it's no longer um, my farm. Unless you're, you work for Halliburton, you're not out here. No. <laughs> Did, where did you say unless you work for where? Halliburton. Okay, I rented it out. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So about us, uh, we were founded in June 2015 in Grayshot, Ohio. Um, that's how it's pronounced by the locals. Everyone outside of Grayshot think it's pronounced differently. It is not correct. <laughs> um, we focus on marine species. Like I said, first saltwater shrimp farm in Ohio, according to ODNR. Currently, we have 13,248 square feet of production space, 34 grow outs, four intermediate, and four nursery tanks. Um, each one of those nursery tanks hold about 15,000 PLs when they come in. Uh, the intermediate, uh, they are in there for about three to four weeks, and then they put in the intermediate tanks uh, for about one to two weeks before they finally get out to the grow out tanks. Um, each grow out tank, uh, depending on the bioflock development is between six and seven thousand uh, shrimp at one time but when they first start out they're starting around three thousand um, and we harvest five to six tanks per month 1250 to 1425 pounds of shrimp per, per month um, all sold mostly to wholesalers and restaurants a uh, big reason why I moved was to focus more on retail um, and we're in the initial stages of producing other, other uh, species, in addition to working with the cooperative to offer uh, species I don't currently produce. Again, that's a picture of my old facility. Uh, it's full of trucks now, so don't, don't go there. <laughs> so so uh, you might have heard I'm on the move. Um, in addition to moving to the new facility, it includes moving all that water as well. And Bill and I share the same mindset that the water is the most important part and the products, the, the fish, the seafood that's produced is just a byproduct. Of course, that's the, mo the part that we sell. But um, moving all that water is definitely worth it. Um, not when you're actually moving it, but uh, that's a different story. We have two Potasco facilities. One's going to be open to the public and one's going to be private. Um, one's on the opposite of the highway on 70 across from the Amazon building. You guys see that on 70. And then the facility that will be open is right next to my house in the Tascla, uh, right down the street from Lynn's Fruit Farm, if you know where that is. Um, I don't have addresses for either because I asked the city of Etna and the Tascla to give me a, the address. Uh, they have the sign address to a new land property. Um, it's been three weeks. I don't know what's so hard about giving me a dress. I know my house is this number, the next neighbor is that number, just pick a number in between, but that's the zoning director's job. Um, and a big uh, thing I like about the new facilities, I was able to dictate exactly what I needed. The other facilities, you know, I bought these facilities from banks or, you know, they, they were very, very cheap, but they were not built to be a shrimp farm. If you've been to my old, this, this is a picture of my new facility, um, my old facility has 28 foot high ceilings. Uh, if you guys got on a tour last year, you would have seen it. Um, of course, all the heat goes to the ceiling, which increases costs. Um, but yeah, and you can tell I'm not even done. I just finished moving water two weeks ago. That was a lot of water to move around. Um, I haven't even put insulation on the top there yet. So I'll have my Amish guys have to climb up there later and put insulation panels up there. So um, I'm not going to do that, but <laughs> having someone else do that. So we're going to talk about shrimp and bioflock. Uh, they are working hand in hand. Bioflock, if you haven't known, uh, known already, is bacteria. 11 million microbes per milliliter of water. That's a lot of organisms. Uh, two to twenty percent of that is actual bacteria. Rough water west is organic matter, and organic matter being food that, that that's not eaten, um, decaying uh, species, the decaying shrimp that become part of that. And shrimp are scavengers; they'll eat whatever they can um, to survive. Uh, feed, but the shrimp they also feed not only on others, 
uh, but also on the feed I give them and also the bioflock itself, which accounts for one third of the shrimp food source. In reality, like I said, the shrimp to me is just a byproduct, the part that I sell, the water is the most important part. And it's a complex but reasonably comprehensive system. Um, if you see the water, it's, it looks brown, um, but the water is not actually brown, it's really clear. Um, all that is bacteria, all of that is bioflock floating around. If you take an Imhoff cone and uh, take a swig of that and let it settle, you'll see that the top will be clear um, and all the bioflock settles mostly to the bottom. And it, you can see it's a recirculating system. A lot of systems I visited, I, for my day job I travel quite a bit um, as an engineer and go to visit other farms while I'm out there. Like I just was in Charlotte, North Carolina for a client and I decided to visit a shrimp farm down there. Um, and a lot of that, their systems it's not working really well, um, mostly because they're not recirculating the water. They're just throwing a diffuser in there and letting it, you know, um, sit there. And stir of course, it stirs up the immediate area, but it doesn't recirculate the water, creating a current. And shrimp, they're not dumb animals, but um, if there's no current, they tend to sit around. And when you want them to grow as much as they can and eat as much as they can as well, they need movement. So you can't see them, but they're swimming against the current. And this is all material. These are basic parameters. My parameters for testing um, are off this, but this is the general uh, source from Purdue University. I can sh show you the article as well. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it if you've been doing research on salt water. <coughs> um, that's a good basis to, to go off of, but as you start your own farms, you'll notice so certain things work better than others and what you think might not be the same uh, as someone, some other farmer who hasn't seen the same thing and maybe they've seen something that you haven't seen. Um, another reason why I work with a lot of shrimp researchers and shrimp farmers all over the country and in other countries is because a lot of times I can't see everything, they can see something I can and then we share. And it's a good system to have, especially for a industry that's always developing. Does Ashton, uh, uh, just your with your bio flock and, and it creating a current. Yes. Um, you were saying that it, it kind of stays towards the bottom, you know, kind of filters because it's obviously heavier than water. So, is there a concern that you would separate your bio flock too much if you get too high of a turbor factor in your system? Um, I I really don't think there's a concern unless you can actually see the water settling because it does get to that point where the bioflock is too heavy and it sinks to the bottom. Um, that's when you have to have a settling tank connected to it and recirculate that out. Okay. Um, most of that heavy stuff, that, if, if there's too much heavy organic matter, we're talking, I think you would all smell it before you see it, but if all the shrimp die in there, it's all just gonna float right back to the bottom because of the mass. Um, that's where you have to turn on the settlement tank. Hopefully not all your shrimp have died at that, that point. Um, but that's not an issue as long as your water looks like that. Um, and the shrimp do a great job to move that around. And that's why this water, whenever you're you know, taking that water out, putting in another tank, you want to get all the shrimp out. And it's very important to take all the shrimp out because you don't want your net. I've, I've been in there where you're netting all around and you think there, there's nothing in there and then you drain the whole thing there's still 15 pounds in there. Um, it's happened and you do not want to put your PLs in there. Another issue with the one in North, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, right off the border, is that they don't have the facility to have a separate space designated for putting the water away, collecting all that shrimp, putting the water back, and then putting the PLs in. Because shrimp, these shrimp, they're very hardy, they don't like killing, they're not like crayfish or even the prawns where they're very territorial and um, they'll eat each other if they have to. So if you don't feed them, of course they're, they need to eat. Um, if there's a dead guy there, they'll eat it, that's fine. But they don't actively pursue each other um, to eat. Um, tiger prawns are a different story. They'll kill 10 before they start eating. And that's just how they are. Um, but. The general rule is if you have a shrimp in there that's three times the size of another, it's going to go after it if um, it's hungry. But having a shrimp in there moves all that bioflock around. 
Um, and as long as it looks like the water I you saw, it's good. Um, what else was I going to say? That water, I never have no shrimp in there for more than six hours because of the system it's in. The bioflock needs the shrimp just as much as the shrimp need the bioflock. Um, it really disrupts the system if um, there's not both of them in there. And it doesn't help that all that matter sells the bottom when no shrimp are in there to move it around. And um, here we're talking about bioflock being a perfect system. It's not a perfect system. There's advantages and disadvantages. Boost feed conversion ratio, we saw 1.1 to 1, that's good. Um, for shrimp, it's more 1.3 to 1. Um, it could get better and bioflock helps that. Um, less mechanical maintenance, there, I don't have any you know, activated carbon filters or any of that. The only thing I have is a settling tank, but the more developed ones, they don't use a settling tank more than twice a year. They keep each other in balance because there's such a developed system already. It's a cost effective system. Higher survival rates, mostly my survival rates hangs around the 85 to 90% survival rate. Um, faster growth rates, theoretically, there's still a lot of research being dealt in there. If you feed them too much, they slow down. If you feed them too little, they slow down. There's so many factors in there that theoretically you should be able to get faster growth rates. Um, but it's still a point of ongoing research, especially with um, Dr. Tom over at Zebra Feeds. Um, quick ammonia smell control. If you've ever walked in the shrimp facility, it should not smell like, you, you, you shouldn't smell a bad smell. It should smell, you should see, smell a little salt, but it shouldn't smell horrible. Um, that's a good thing. It's a quick ammonia, um, it breaks down ammonia really quickly. The next level is breaking down the nitrite to nitrate, which takes a little longer because bacteria there is less comprehensive. It's a good mistakes disease buffer as well. Disadvantages, daily testing required. Now I do have tanks that, <coughs> you know, um, we, we test every day and then sometimes these more developed tanks, we skip a day for some of these tests, but that's because we know it's gonna be fine. But when you're first starting out, it has to be tested every day. I love sea, I'm a visual person, so I do not like not being able to see the shrimp unless they're coming to the surface. So that's another problem with the bioflock. Limited species flexibility thus far, I've only seen this kind of system with tilapia and shrimp. Um, on, a, on a whole, on a um, commercial scale. Quick mortality without mutual holes, that goes back to why the shrimp need the water and the water needs shrimp. Constant suspension, um, that, that, well, you should have that already because you have it aerated anyway. Um, and then uh, it's, the problem with the bioflock with so many uh, animals in there, um, it kind of is able to tip the dissolved oxygen scale if you don't watch it because you're talking about millions of organisms there in there needing to breathe. And the shrimp, yeah, they're in there too, um, but there are a lot more bacterial um, and animals in there than actual shrimp. So that can tip the scale. And I did notice <coughs> that I had to increase my oxygen uh, capacity quite a bit as they develop more and more because to balance this tip scale. Because when you first start out, one of those pent air regenerative blow blowers, the one horsepower one, it, it supplied about five tanks oxygen at six milligrams per liter. Um, but then as they developed past the about seven, eight months after that second harvest, um, I realized I needed to up the horsepower to 1.5 in order to sustain the same amount of tanks. And it might increase more, but I have not increased it uh, thus far. And um, <clears throat> so we know that it's a major <coughs> source of food for the shrimp. Um, but shrimp, when I was talking to Dr. Tom or Ziegler, are the earliest forms of advanced bioflock farmers. 
and you guys are looking at me like I'm, well, I am weird, but <laughs> you guys think I'm more so. Um, I gave the same look to Dr. Tom when he was trying to explain it to me when I was visiting him. But if you think about it, it is true. Uh, you see that shrimp has a kind of like a black bandage right there. Um, the bioflock, like shrimp, they get injured like anything else in there, they fight. Um, and if they get injured, the bacteria tend to go towards that uh, wound and help it heal and have a bandage there. Um, it, it goes hand in hand with helping each other out. So that's a unique part. I don't know how true it is, but Dr. Tom swears it's true and it makes sense to me. So if it makes sense to me, um, I haven't done any research on this yet, but he has the research facility in Miami. So um, I, I agreed with him for now. <laughs> Big difference between farmed responsibly and unsustainable. If you ever been to the coast coastline down in Texas, you'll see a lot of empty ponds like this. And that's another thing with these farm species, uh, farm shrimp farms, is that people have a bad idea of what they look like, you know, a bad taste in their mouth about it because they, especially those in those communities close to these abandoned ponds, they see these farms start up and then a few years later abandon these tanks of filth. Um, and it would be because the EPA doesn't know what to do with this stuff. And it's a big issue, especially if a natural disaster happens, um, especially what happened with the hurricanes this past season. I, I was not surprised uh, when they test the water um, it, down in Houston and it has a bunch of different bacteria in there that shouldn't be in there um, because this is just festering off the coastline. So, um, and compared to that system, it, it's a, you know, a difference of night and day. To me, of course, but I don't know, does it just look like brown water to you guys? <laughs> I would swim in that one if I had to, not this one. <laughs> Future of the system, we hope to keep doing more research and diversifying the system. It's a very good system, even though it's not perfect. Better understanding and knowledge of all the parts of the bioflock system, more precise manipulation of the of all the um, characteristics, uh, methods to speed up growth. We're always trying to grow faster. We're always trying to, but at the same time, we don't want to feed them chemicals, antibiotics, uh, to make them grow uh, grow fast um, that way. But we want them naturally, as best as naturally as we can, to grow as quickly as we can. Um, and I hope to continue the expansion of the U.S. aquaculture industry, which, as Matt was giving a presentation, there's, we've done a lot of good things, but we have a long way to go, especially overcoming the seafood deficit. And that's a picture of one of the largest, oops, there we go back. <coughs> that's a picture of one of the largest shrimp we've, we've produced. I think that's like 67 and a half grams. So about seven or eight of them make a, make a pound. So it's a pretty big fish, uh, shrimp. Uh, and you can see this one has like a red under, undertone to it. We did notice when you guys get these as PLs, you don't see it until they grow out to juveniles, but you'll notice that some of them have different hues. I've had blue ones, I've had green hued ones. Um, I've had red ones, but I noticed that the red ones grow much faster than the other ones. Uh, usually the, the big guy bullying all the other shrimp in there is the red one. <laughs> <laughs> if you get too much krill in its feet. <laughs> That's possible. Um, a big elephant in the room, I don't think a lot of people talk about it, is about all the shrimp farms that have closed up. Florida Organic has closed up in Florida. I'm working with, with a company in Felsmere, we're doing Pompano, so we bought a lot of that equipment. A few years ago in 2010, the big shrimp farm out in Las Vegas closed up within eight months. Uh, New Mexico State, they had a program that recently closed as well. Uh, all of them were bigger than my system. Um, and it, it's a lot of issues with each one and each one had their own um, reasons why they ultimately closed. But these are a 
few of the reasons why not. It's not the Bioflop's fault. They didn't realize that you can't pump out 85% survival rate from the beginning. And that's why I went through all the trouble to move my water, okay? Everyone thinks that I'm crazy. <laughs> Once again, I am crazy, but not that crazy. Um, the Bioflop is the most important part of the system. A fully developed Bioflop system takes about two years to develop. And uh, it's unrealistic expectations, again, when it comes to producing uh, survival rates off the bat of 80 plus percent. You're gonna get closer to 20% when you first start up. Marketing issues, again, a lot of people aren't very good at marketing. I guess that's why Jordan and everyone here is focusing on marketing a lot. Because well, we know how to grow it, but it's a different thing to actually sell it. <clears throat> uh, subpart planning, that, that's generalized, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Financial problems, again, that's a vague answer, but covers a lot. Uh, lack of knowledge, a lot of them have not grown, uh, raised anything aquaculture wise in their lives and expect and saw someone you know sell shrimp or sell this for how much money and think that it would be easy. If it was easy everyone would do it. <laughs> um, and, to be, and with those three systems, too big, too fast, too many hands in a pot, you had angel investors, you had, you, you know, uh, a big facility. And I always give, give the idea, of if you, you're a farmer and you had 100 acres to farm, and for the first two years, you'll get, you'll be able to sell 20 to 40 acres worth of crop. But you still have the same expenses, the same time you put in. I don't know many people that will survive with 20%, 40% survival rate. Unless you're, you play baseball and you get a five with 300 batting average. <laughs> you get to go to the Hall of Fame then. So that's the idea I give. It, and these are problems that I think a lot of new businesses have in general. You know, eight out of every 10 new business closes within three years. Um, it, it's the same thing, but since we're talking about aquaculture, this is what I was focused on. And uh, this facility is the one out in Las Vegas. It's still empty. It's still for sale if anyone wants it. <laughs> <laughs> how many? How many tanks? How, many, how big was it? It was 130,000 square feet. <coughs> yeah. So, I mean, so how many? Sorry, I have trouble, you know, graphically seeing how many. How many? You know, 15 foot. How many tanks is 130,000 square feet? Well, they had different <coughs> setups. Yeah. They had more rectangular tanks. Oh, okay. and you and I, we can talk about, oh. I've seen the difference between rectangular and circle tanks. Right. Circle tanks are much better for recirculatory systems, in yeah. my opinion, for shrimp, than for a rectangular tanks. Right. Uh, it's just much easier to work with, but of course, um, it's much more efficient if you could just line up a bunch of rectangular yeah. tanks and fill out all that space. Um, that's what they did here. Oh, okay. um, I, I don't know how many they had in there, but they were only open for it six, seven, eight months. Oh my God, that's terrible. Yeah, and they were in Las Vegas, which is yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe they could, maybe they spent too much money cooling the facility down. Yeah, and they, they got a lot of money from the state to start this, really? and you wonder why a lot of states are like, well, what's the history of shrimp farming? It hasn't been very successful. We, uh, the one in Minnesota is working now with Ralph Coe. Uh, Dr. Tom and I have talked about that, and we have doubts about that system, so. And didn't the, the Del Marva one have some problems too? Yeah, they do. <laughs> um, but this one, I, I can expand on this one in particular, 130,000 square feet. Again, 20% survival rate. You have a lot of hands in a pot. It's all investor based. Uh, the water is starting brand new. You're using rectangular tanks, which aren't as good as uh, circular tanks. You have people that you know, never farmed anything in their lives. Of course, they hired, hired, um, you know, uh, people all over the world that do aquaculture, but at the same time, that's a lot of money. You have to bring them over. And again, it's still empty to this day. They lit up everything like a Christmas tree. Um, if you go to my facility, I only turn on one light, and it's an LED light, because they need a, um, a night light. If you turn off all the lights, you can't do that. 
it'll jump out like crazy. Um, they waste a lot of energy on that, electricity alone. And uh, I'm working on my new facility, opening late summer. Um, one of the facilities to the public, increasing production on other things. We're gonna be more of like a seafood store, so we're gonna follow Dr. Dave's. If you've ever been to Freshwater Farms, we're gonna follow that model. Um, similarly, but he and I differ in different ideas, of course. Um, but mine is gonna be more focused on the cooperative work, uh, working with other farmers that you know, like I said, farming it, raising it is one one problem, and selling it is another problem. And this, I'm trying to help um, the selling part. Um, that's why me and Matt are in the committee for the co-op. Uh, researching other facilities, especially marine species. My focus on marine species is because I see 10 uh, fish farms. I'd say nine of them are marine species. Uh, you know, you see some shrimp. You see the coral farm up in New Albany. That's about it. Um, so I think there's a big need for uh, uh, marine species. We're talking pompano. Uh, of course, we can't grow halibut. We can't grow lobster yet. Um, but that's what I, my focus is on. Um, and, and again, the co-op. I, I can give a little backdrop to the co-op with what we envision. And we know there, there's a lot of you that are just starting out and it's really hard to start out. Um, not only getting the money to, to financially start out, but actually learning everything all at once, it's tough. Um, and we want to defray the cost as much as possible. Especially when it comes to feed. When you guys start out, you're not buying a pallet of feed. Buying a bag, two bags. You can visit Dr. Tom in the middle of Pennsylvania uh, if you're stopping by. <laughs> Um, to pick up a bag, but it, it's not cost effective. So what we're doing is I'm working with some tilapia farmers in Zanesville, and then um, Bill Lynch is working with Matt Graham up in um, Lund Marysville, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, he, we're going to try to order semi loads of feed uh, because Ziegler promised um, a couple dollars off per pallet if we order. Uh, semi loads and of course we can hop your one bag on there and, and you know Ziegler makes a bunch of different feeds if you have other animals to feed like they have parrots feed I don't know if anyone has a parrot so we're trying to get that together but that's the first the lowest reaching fruit um, for, for the committee and then we'll go towards the marketing together aspect and we, Matt talked a little bit about that, and Bill has that list of 56 growing number of restaurants in Columbus, and I have my list all over the state of people we sell to that are like, we love your product, uh, what else can you provide? Because think about it, you go to a store, you don't want to pick up you know, one thing and then have to come back later. You want to get as much as you can uh, in one trip. So they're always asking, what else you got? That's the main reason why I started Pompano. I asked them, what else you want me to make? And they're like, Pompano in a pound, pound and a half. All right, then that sounds reasonable. <laughs> um, but that's what we're trying to do. We have our list of restaurants. We have all the restaurants that are interested. I haven't met a high-end restaurant that's not interested in our product um, if we get this done. Um, so what we envision is saying having 100 restaurants throughout the state uh, they give us an order on Thursday or Friday saying how much seafood product they want the following week. So they'll say uh, 50 pounds of shrimp, 40 pounds of tilapia, 30 pounds of I don't know, perch, um, 10 pounds of bluegill. And we'll have that shipped to a processing facility. Um, of course, you know, gathering all those amounts from different farms, ship that to a processing facility and have it processed Monday and then shipped out Tuesday. So of course that takes a lot of coordination, but I think it's worth it, um, especially helping everyone out because you guys are just starting to get out to producing it. That's one challenge, but selling it is a different, totally different challenge. And there's been farm farmers I've talked to in the past that, uh, for my research, and uh, they're like, well, I used to farm perch or whatever, 
but I just couldn't sell it. I have a thousand fish sitting at home, no one wants to buy it, and then they stop. So um, a lot of people over, over um, they, they don't realize the selling aspect is just as important. Even though I, I don't like salespeople in my company, uh, <laughs> engineering and sales don't get along. Uh, but they're a necessary evil, I guess. And I came my press, made my presentation short, I hope, because I know there's going to be some questions. So, fire away.